All right, well, welcome back. This week, moving on to constitutional law, and we're going to start with a scenario. And the scenario is one that uh, many of you are probably familiar with, although, as with many of my examples, it's getting a little bit dated. So it relates to social media use in student athletes at the interscholastic level. So the little quote I have on there is a, an inside joke that only I get, uh, so not a very effective one. Um, but the the title of the slide there, Social Media, the Downfall of Society. The quote comes from a former football coach at the University of Texas, Charlie Strong, who, as far as I know, is still at South Florida. Um, but when he got the job at Texas in, I believe, 2014, some of the local sports media asked him what he thought about uh, player use of social media, and he commented that social media was going to be the downfall of society, which was pretty funny, and then every time a player from anywhere got in trouble for their social media use on Austin Sports Radio, they always played the little clip of, of uh, Charlie Strong saying it was the downfall of society. So anyway, related to that, let's talk about something that happened here in Wisconsin in December of 2015. And so specifically what happened was in that month, December of 2015, the Wisconsin Interscholastic Athletic Association, you all know it as the WIAA, sent an advisory email to schools about an increase in the, quote, amount of chance by student sections directed at opponents and or opponent supporters that are clearly intended to disrespect, end quote. And the email included examples of such disrespect as things like, or chants like, quote, you can't do that, or to the same basic tune, fundamentals, you get the gist. There's also airball, there's a net there, Civ, scoreboard, and then during the playoffs, season's over. So the email from the WIAA was forwarded to students by their individual schools. So a basketball player at Hilbert High School, her name is April Gell, not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but I think so, uh, posted on Twitter about that policy, um, and her post contained a, a profanity directed at the WIAA. I couldn't find the original post, but I think it's something to the effect of F the WIAA, something to that effect. Um, so in addition to being a basketball player at Hilbert, she was also a volleyball player. So the picture there is her in her volleyball uniform. So the WIAA didn't at the time, or in, as far as I know, doesn't now, but didn't at the time have a policy on social media use by students. That said, Hilbert High School did have a policy against profanity and employed it to suspend Gell for five basketball games. So the question I have for you is, do you think that if April Gell had filed a lawsuit against the Hilbert School District for suspending her for those five games, and her suit would have alleged that the school violated her First Amendment right to freedom of speech, do you think that suit would be successful? Would she be able to argue successfully that the WIAA violated the First Amendment guarantee that she has to freedom of speech? So obviously we can't have an actual in-person discussion about this, but typically um, the room is, is usually broken down about 50-50 split on this one. Um, oftentimes students will say, well, she probably had to sign some sort of an agreement in order to, um, or pertaining to her use of social media, and so she clearly would have violated that agreement, and so because of that, they are in the right to suspend her. The question becomes, though, can you just sign an agreement and give away your constitutionally guaranteed rights? And the answer to that is no. Um, so, um, but it depends upon the, what, what we're talking about here. So we'll get into some of the nuance of that. Um, so my hope is by the end of this that you'll be able to see, uh, have a clear idea of whether or not her lawsuit would have been successful. So before we get into that, let's get into the basics of constitutional law. And some of this stuff is going to be a rehash from things that we've already talked about earlier in the class, but you'll hear them for a second time or third time anyway. All right, so constitutional law. So what are constitutions? So we've talked about this a little bit before. This is one of the rehashes. Um, but the U.S. government and all 50 states have constitutions which set forth their basic organization, their powers, and the limits of those respective governments. So constitutional law, then, is the law as expressed in those constitutions. And as previously discussed, the U.S. Constitution, so the federal constitution, was adopted in 1787, and the Bill of Rights, which are the first ten amendments, were adopted in 1791. Now, it's important to note that the Bill of Rights doesn't directly apply to the states, and originally only to the federal government, but the Supreme Court held that the 14th Amendment, which was passed shortly after the Civil War, I believe in 1868, uh, makes those guarantees, 
in the Bill of Rights applicable to individual states. But further, it's also important to note that rights guaranteed by the Bill of Rights are not absolute, meaning that just because you have freedom of speech doesn't mean you can say absolutely anything you want, whenever you want, wherever you want, without any sort of a consequence. So an, the example that I gave previously in class was you can't um, have a sign protesting UW-Whitewater's tuition or something to that effect and go stand in the middle of Warhawk Drive right before a football game and expect that you'll be able to continue to do that. So, And the reason that you would not be able to continue to do that standing in the middle of the road is that you are impeding um, public safety and so you are also impeding a very necessary function of the government, which is to be able to ensure safe travel. So that would not be something that you would be allowed to do. So the important point there is that the, those rights, even though you have freedom of speech, you don't have freedom of speech everywhere all the time is an important thing to know. So um, related to that, so one of the things we'll talk about, or one of the, one of the amendments we've touched on previously when we talked about um, about screening for drugs is the Fourth Amendment. And so, so the Fourth Amendment prohibits unreasonable search and seizure, but the rights tend to be pretty ambiguous. So what exactly is an unreasonable search and seizure? And again, we touched on that a little bit as it pertains to drug testing. Um, but one of the most recent rulings related to that comes from a Supreme Court decision in 2014. And the overall question was, can the police search the contents of your cell phone without your permission and without a warrant. And so the case actually comes from uh, California. So the, the particular case is Riley versus California from 2014. And the specifics of the case are that Riley was driving a car with an expired registration. And so he gets pulled over by the police for driving with his expired registration. And then once the police pull him over and start talking to him, of course, they wanna see his license and uh, his insurance. And so when he hands over his license, they note that his license is expired. And so because of that, he can't be driving. And so they then have to have the car towed. But that particular police department, I believe this is in San Diego, that police department uh, had a policy that everything in the car had to be inventoried before they towed it. And so when they were doing the inventory, they found his cell phone. And his cell phone, they were able to unlock. I guess he didn't have a, a password. Because again, at this time, it's so the case itself is in 2014. So the incident was, was probably several years earlier, maybe more like 2009. Um, but at any rate, the police were able to get into his cell phone without using a password or without his permission. And so when they were kind of scrolling through his phone to see what was on there, one of the things that they found, or some of the things that they found were pictures of Riley. Um, and the, the pictures of him included him being pictured with a car that was involved in a drive-by and also pictures of him um, with known gang members. And so because of those pictures, the state was able to secure a conviction against Riley um, for, I believe in that case, it was attempted murder, something to that effect. So um, based on the, the drive-by shooting. So the reason that case came before the Supreme Court was Riley and his attorneys argued that the evidence used to convict him, those pictures, were inadmissible because it was an unreasonable search and seizure whenever they looked through his phone because the reason that they had pulled him over again was because of his expired registration. So ultimately the Supreme Court did decide that that was an unreasonable search and seizure uh, and so his conviction in that case was overturned. So. The key thing there, again, with, with all of this stuff, they're written really ambiguously. So, you know, as we talked about with drug testing, search and seizure, what does that mean? Is a drug test a search? Uh, it is, is it unreasonable? And, and why or why not? So, um, and, and that ambiguity is, is intentional so that the courts have the ability to decide on a case-by-case -case basis um, if something is constitutional or not. So anytime there's a question about constitutional rights, the first thing that the plaintiff is gonna to have to prove is that there's state action. So one of the things that we've talked about before is that with those rights guaranteed in the Bill of Rights, that prevents the government from infringing upon those rights, but not private actors. So the first thing you have to prove then is that it's the government or some government agency that is infringing upon your rights in order to uh, win your case related to infringement of your freedom of speech, freedom of religion, etc. So state action then 
is any action of the federal or state governments or their subdivisions, such as city or county governments or agencies, and of course that also includes state, uh, state universities like our own uh, UWW. So other than the 13th Amendment, which prohibits slavery, all other protections regarding individual rights apply only to government or state actors. Any action taken by a private entity may constitute state action if the state uh, exercises coercive power over that private action and has substantially uh, encouraged the action or was significantly involved in the action. So that's that concept near the bottom of the slide called entanglement. And so the idea there is that if a private actor is so uh, entangled with, so enmeshed with the state that that private actor is effectively acting on the state's behalf, well then even though they're a private entity, they may be considered a state actor. So as an example, the NCAA has been challenged for infringement of, of uh, constitutionally guaranteed rights. So when people try to say that the NCAA is a state actor, the basic line of argument is that the NCAA is largely run by, uh, or it is run by, presidents of universities. And then you also have, associated with the NCAA, you have athletic directors, you also have faculty athletics representatives, um, you have women's representatives, etc. And so many of those representatives, many of those university presidents are representatives of or employees of public universities and they're acting in their official capacity. So the argument is that because the NCAA is run in large part or their actions are dictated in large part by state employees who again work for state universities acting in their official capacity, that the NCAA is in fact a state actor. That said, the courts have ruled repeatedly that the NCAA is not a state actor. So the court, uh, Supreme Court ruled in 1984, 1988, and again in 1999 that the NCAA is not a state actor. Interestingly, high school associations have been found repeatedly to be state actors basically on that logic. So the, the case there, Brentwood Academy versus the Tennessee, Tennessee Secondary Schools Association, that's the Tennessee equivalent of the WIAA, uh, and so in that particular case, um, the basic logic was that the Supreme, the Supreme Court found that the athletic association's regulatory activity did constitute state action because of the pervasive involvement of, school, of state school officials in its structure. So 84% of the membership of the Tennessee Secondary School Association was comprised of public schools and represented by public officials acting in their official capacity. So as such, because you've got these individuals who work for public schools and then run the secondary school association, because of that, the secondary school association is a state actor. So by that logic then, the WIAA is a state actor. So the first thing that April Gell would have to prove if she sued over a violation of her First Amendment rights, she'd have to prove that the WIAA is a state actor, and that would be pretty straightforward. Her attorneys would simply point to the precedent set in Brentwood and say, look, courts have found previously that, um, or the Supreme Court in that case has found previously, that um, high school associations are state actors, and so because of that, the WIAA is one of those, so this is state action infringing upon her right to freedom of speech. Things get a little bit different in professional sports, so primarily because uh, pro sports leagues are private actors, so they're owned by uh, billionaires, um, but they're, they're run by a, a host of private individuals, and so they are not part of the government in the same sense that a, that a uh, something like the WIAA would be. So the, the rules are a little bit different as far as what sorts of restrictions they're allowed to uh, place on their athletes. So for example, in 2014, a defensive back for, uh, for the Miami Dolphins, whose name was Don Jones, tweeted, quote, OMG, end quote, and, quote, horrible, end quote, after the St. Louis Rams selected openly gay defensive end Michael Sam in the seventh round of the draft. It was, the, it was alleged that the tweets were not a response to the drafting of Sam, because he was a very good player, but instead in reaction to Sam's on-camera celebra celebratory kiss with his boyfriend just after Sam's selection. Don Jones was fined an undisclosed amount of money by the team and suspended from team activities until he completed sensitivity training. So, but the, if Jones had sued the NFL, he would have been unsuccessful because, again, the NFL is not a state actor. They are run by, they're a private entity, effectively. 
And then there's a there's another wrinkle in the case of pro sports because they're they are governed by collective bargaining agreements, and so we'll talk more about those later. But the gist of it is, um, you can give away certain protections um, as part of things like collective bargaining agreements. So as as a bargain between um, a union and an employer, you you can give away certain rights, and we'll get to those uh, specific rights later. Um, although not constitutionally guaranteed rights. So, not to confuse you too much, um, but um, the key there basically is that the NFL is a private actor. So, so, Don Jones could have attempted to make the case that the NFL is a state actor, and, and certainly individuals have argued that the NFL should be considered a state actor under this idea of entanglement. Basically, that the NFL is so uh, intermeshed with the federal government that they could be considered part of a government. So before telling you about that logic, let me tell you about the case that set that precedent there at the bottom of the slide. So Gilmore versus City of Montgomery from 1974. And so in that case, uh, a local government, so in Montgomery, Alabama, had granted exclusive use and control of public recreation facilities to a segregated private school, which of course was not allowed at that time, or is not allowed at this time, or, or uh, certainly not then either. So the court found that the city's actions had allowed the schools to save money on athletics, which diverted, allowed them to divert their savings into their educational programs. So basically the fact that they didn't have to spend money on uh, renting public fields allowed the school to use the money that they saved to make their academic programs better. So the, the favor that the local government did them allowed the school to flourish, put them in a better position, essentially. So that's, that's entanglement. Um, so where the, where the state government, its actions are so bound up with a private entity that the private entity has the effect of being the state. Um, and so the, the argument for the NFL being a state actor is, is essentially that the NFL gets public funding for their stadiums. So some stadiums are, fu are funded more than 50% by the public. And so because of that, the NFL, or at least certain franchises, are particularly reliant on on the public, so on taxpayers. So they could be considered, that's part of the evidence that they could be considered a state actor. In addition to that, the NFL um, gets tax breaks. So they were actually considered a nonprofit or they had nonprofit status from 1942 until 2015. And they gave up that status essentially due to public outcry about how ridiculous it was that the NFL could be considered a nonprofit. Now that was the NFL as a whole, like as an institution, not the individual franchises. Um, but those tax exemptions, the reason that those are given is typically to help prop up things that the market might not sustain. So things like symphonies or even hospitals that it might be difficult for those those entities to make it, but they're necessary for culture, necessary for health, etc. Um, and so the NFL got the same kind of tax breaks until 2015. So the NFL as an organization on the whole probably got out of paying somewhere between 10 and 15 million dollars in taxes per year. In addition to that, the NFL has a monopoly on their broadcasting rights, um, so they they are um, able to control their broadcasting rights exclusively. Um, and so because of all those different things, between stadium funding, tax exemptions, and the government looking the other way on their, their monopolistic control of their broadcasting, that has enabled the NFL to become the sports juggernaut that it is. And so the basic argument is that the NFL wouldn't be what it is, wouldn't have massive stadiums, you wouldn't see um, tens of millions of viewers per week. You wouldn't see the Super Bowl being the cultural phenomenon that it is without all of that government help. And so because of that, the NFL could be considered a, an arm of the government. I don't think that argument would win in court, but that's the basic outline that somebody would make if they wanted to uh, sue for the NFL infringing upon their rights. So if Don Jones really had sought to file suit uh, over the NFL over their infringement upon his right to freedom of speech based on his social media use, that's probably the basic line of argument that he and his attorneys would have taken. All right, so let's get to specific amendments. We don't have a ton to cover, um, but we'll start, we'll take it from the top. We'll start with the First Amendment. So you can see the wording of the First Amendment there. And that wording says that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble, 
and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So there's actually quite a bit going on there. There's not, a, there's not many words, but there is a, a ton going on there. So before we get into some of the, sp the specifics on that, there's a picture in the lower right of the slide. And that picture is a group of high school cheerleaders from a town in Texas uh, named Kuntz. So Kuntz is a town that's about 25 miles north of Beaumont, if you know where that is, uh, in Beaumont, east of Houston. And it's about 25 miles from the Louisiana state line. And so what those uh, young women are holding up is a run-through sign. So, you know, the cheerleaders make that sign before the Friday night varsity football game, and they hold that sign up, and then the varsity team runs through that sign before they go out to play whatever other middle-of-nowhere town from East Texas that they're going to play. So, uh, and you can see the wording on there. It's a Bible verse. It says, if God is with us, who can be against us? So one of the things to think about here, um, and this is actually one of the, the topics for the discussion board for this week, is the question of the Kuntz cheerleaders and whether or not this is um, a protected type of speech, or if this is establishment of religion on the part of the government. So an important thing to understand before you do that discussion board is that most of the school districts in Texas are referred to as independent school district. So Kuntz would be Kuntz Independent School District or Kuntz ISD. That does not mean that they are a private entity. So they are, if you're an independent school district, you are a public school district. And again, as it pertains to state action, that's an important thing to know. <clears throat> the other type of school district is a consolidated one, which just means it's several different towns consolidated together. Um, that's a consolidated school district. So what you need to know, though, is that Kuntz is a public entity. They are a public school district, so that's going to be important. So I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here. So, you know, they're signed there. If God is with us, who can be against us? Um, one of the classes I used to teach was uh, sport ethics, and then we also, as part of that class, got into sport philosophy. So one of the things that, that I find striking about signs like that is from a for sport philosophy standpoint, the claim that God is on Kuntz's side. Well, what happens if Kuntz loses? Were they wrong that God was on their side? Did God switch sides? Did they not do something during the game to be able to continue to have his favor? So one of the, the things that I find interesting here is that the implicit assumption is that, uh, that God doesn't favor their opponent for some reason not sure what that is, but but by holding the sign, they are basically implying that um, God, or they're saying that God is with them, and implying, of course, that God is, by a turn, against their opponent, which is a pretty bold claim. Also, of course, why would God take sides on the outcome of a Texas high school football game? So, and from a sport philosophy standpoint, there was an article I used to make my class read that was about essentially what if prayer did work, would that be unsporting? And so the, the article's author essentially argued that if you prayed for help that was beyond your capacity, so to have superhuman strength, superhuman speed, etc., that, that basically you prayed for divine assistance to help you win, and that prayer was granted, so you got help that everybody else didn't get, that in fact that that would be unsporting, which I always found to be an interesting argument. All right, so that's the end of that tangent. Okay, so as it pertains to religion, so you can see the, the first two clauses there. Um, so Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. And so effectively what that means is you can't have state-sponsored religion, that there is not uh, a particular religion that is associated with the U.S. government. So it prohibits the government from endorsing or aiding one specific religion, say Catholicism, um, as an example, or any other, but just as an example there. Um, and the second clause, prohibiting free exercise thereof, keeps the government from infringing upon your rights to exercise your faith. So uh, keeps the government from saying that you can't go to church services, that you can't go to the church that you want to, that you can't worship as you see fit, those kinds of things. So the, especially the establishment clause there um, is often referred to as this concept of a separation between church and state. And as you've noticed, that wording, the separation of church and state, is nowhere in that First Amendment. And so those words don't actually appear anywhere in the Constitution, but instead in a letter from then-President Thomas Jefferson to the Dansbury Baptist Association in 1802. And in that letter, he described his understanding of the religious clauses of the First Amendment. So the free exercise clause refers to, and 
already mentioned that part, sorry. Uh, so, free exercise clause again, government can't infringe upon your right to worship as you see fit. All right, so if I can get the slide to advance. So in terms of religious issues, we talked about those too. So if you were to take a religious issue to court um, in terms of either establishment of religion or prohibiting free exercise thereof, the court would use three tests to examine whether or not what you were doing was allowed. So if this case went to court, if somebody objected to these signs that these cheerleaders were using and said, you know what, because they are um, students at a public school, wearing the uniform of that public school and therefore acting as representatives in their official capacity. The fact that they're holding up these religious signs gives the appearance of establishment of religion, gives the appearance that Kuntz School District, which is a public school, officially endorses one particular religion, in this case, Christianity. So, so not any particular sect, but that, that it endorses Christianity. So what the court would say then, or how the court would think about that, there's three different tests that they would use. You can see the first one there is the lemon test. And so the lemon test is a three-prong test. Um, and so in order to be constitutional, the first prong is that the practice has to be secular in purpose. So in answering the discussion board response, I want you to consider whether or not this practice is secular in purpose. And so what, what secular means is non-religious. So is this, this practice of the run-through sign, is that something that is secular in purpose? The second prong is, is that practice's primary effect to advance or inhibit religion? So whatever they're doing can neither advance nor inhibit religion. And then the last prong is that the practice must avoid excessive entanglement with religion. So practice has to be secular in purpose can neither ad advance nor inhibit religion and must avoid excessive entanglement with religion. So what I'd like you to do on the discussion board is consider the lemon test and consider whether or not you think this practice of these cheerleaders holding up these signs um, would be allowed under the lemon test or not, and then explain to me your logic. Another test that the Supreme Court might use is the endorsement test, so that the government can't endorse, favor, or dis uh, disapprove of any religion or practice. Um, and we'll talk about that one here in a second with some specific cases. And then the last one there is the coercion test, which is essentially that the government can't coerce individuals to participate in religion or its exercise. So some, some uh, relevant case law for these. So the first there is Santa Fe, Texas versus Doe from 2000. So Santa Fe High School is outside of Houston. Um, unfortunately, gained notoriety relatively recently within the last couple of years for a, a shooting at the school. Um, but prior to that was known for this important legal case. So in the early 1990s, Santa Fe High School had an elected position of student council chaplain. And again, this is a public school. This student was able, but not required, to deliver a prayer over the PA system before each home football game for the entire season. The Supreme Court ruled that the practice was unconstitutional by a vote of 6-3, to three, with John Paul Stevens writing for the majority that, quote, such a system encourages divisiveness along religious lines and threatens the imposition of coercion upon students not desiring to participate in a religious exercise. Simply by establishing this school-related procedure, which entrusts the inherently non-governmental subject of religion to a majoritarian vote, a constitutional violation has occurred." End quote. So according to legal scholars, this case indicates that the court sees nothing special about student-initiated religious conduct when it takes place within a school-sponsored event. Private, voluntary prayer is permitted and protected, but public prayer, which could be construed as coercive or favoring one religion over others, is not. So effectively, um, that student would stand up at the beginning of the game and say, okay, let's pray. Everybody in this small town that was at the game would probably bow their heads and, and participate in this prayer. And so the, the Supreme Court's basic argument is that people would feel coerced to participate in this because if you live in this small town, a lot of people know each other. And so if you're the, you know, one of the very few people who's not participating in this, well, like what's wrong with them? And so to avoid that ostracism or being ostracized, um, what people might do is feel coerced to participate. Okay, I'll bow my head, even though I don't believe this, I'll just go along with it. And so the Supreme Court uh, found that that was an infringement upon their rights. The second case on there, Adler versus Duval County from 2001. Uh, similar idea, but not quite the same. 
So at graduation, uh, the school board allowed graduating seniors to decide, and the first thing the, the seniors get to decide is whether to give a brief opening or closing message. If they decided to do that, which student volunteer would give the message, and then what the content of the message would be. So the message didn't have to be religious in nature, unlike Santa Fe, and it was solely up to the individual making it, um, what the content of the message would be, and school officials were not involved in the process. So the court upheld this practice as constitutional because it didn't require the student to speak on religious or subject matter. And so that's something that, that the Adler case is something you'd want to consider for the Kuhn's cheerleaders because important parts about that ruling is that um, the students were conveying a message, but it, it, there was no requirement that the message be religious in nature. So again, something to consider for the cheerleaders. Um, and an, another important facet of that ruling was that school officials were not involved in that process. And then the last one, yeah, the last one on there, sorry, um, Borden versus the School District Township of East Brunswick from 2008. The facts of that case, or the, the short version of the facts of that case, are that the head football coach engaged in pregame prayer activities in the locker room and at team dinners. The parents from uh, some of the players on the team filed complaints, and the school board directed the coach not to lead team prayers. The coach sued the district for infringement of his First Amendment rights, because he said basically since the, the school district is telling him he can't pray with his team, well then that is a, an infringement on his right to the free exercise of religion, that he, he should be able to pray whenever and wherever and however he wants. Um, the appeals court upheld the district policy, prohibiting him from engaging in team prayer, and agreed that Borden's silent acts, bowing his head and taking a knee during prayer, constituted an, constituted an unconstitutional endorsement of religion. So what you've got there is, again, that idea of coercion. So if, and my high school team did this, um, it, we all said the Lord's Prayer uh, before all of our varsity football games, even though, again, um, like Coons, we were an independent school district, we were a public school, and so, you know, the head coach before the game said, okay, everybody bow your heads in prayer, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer, and so we all did it. Um, and so I wasn't a particularly religious person at that time, didn't really want to participate, but uh, you can bet that I learned all of the words and did participate uh, in part because of this, this idea of coercion. You don't want to be the only person on the team who's not doing it. What's wrong with you? Um, and so very similar kind of thing we see there with this coach um, in Washington State. All right. So students in free speech, because this is going to matter to you if you're working in, uh, if you're working at the high school level, this will be important stuff. The fundamental case regarding student rights to free speech is Tinker versus Des Moines, which come from 1969. And so the, the specifics of that case were that students were suspended for wearing armbands to show disapproval of the Vietnam conflict after the school implemented a policy prohibiting the protest. The court found that the armbands were not, quote, actually or potentially disruptive, end quote, to the school environment. The policy then violated the student's right to freedom of speech because they were expressing their opinion, but in doing so, it wasn't in any way that was disruptive to the school environment. And it was essentially intended to um, promote the free exchange of ideas, and again, to express their opinion. <clears throat> so under certain circumstances, schools do have the ability to regulate general, the general student population's uh, freedom of speech without violating their First Amendment rights. And so those circumstances include, the first one being, that the speech causes or creates a reasonably foreseeable risk of sub substantial disruption of the school environment. So the students did something that, uh, it, you know, let's say they're going to incite a big walkout or something to that effect, and they're going to use the school paper um, to do that. That would obviously be a substantial disruption of the school environment if everybody walked out of their classrooms, and so that's the type of speech then the school would have the ability to regulate. The second type is speech that is vulgar, lewd, obscene, or plainly offensive. So it's something that doesn't contribute to um, the, ex the free expression of ideas, something that essentially has no value. And then the third one there is school-sponsored speech. So in general, schools can take action against speech that is reasonably likely to cause substantial disruption to the school environment and includes true threats and targeting of classmates. 
Speech that contributes to the free exchange of ideas or is too outrageous to be taken seriously is the type of speech that can't be regulated. That said, so there we're just talking about the general student population, your everyday students, but student athletes may be held to higher standards of conduct than other students based upon participation in interscholastic sports. Student athletes have a decreased expectation of privacy because by choosing to go out for the team, they voluntarily agreed to subject themselves to a degree of regulation even higher than that imposed on students generally. And so some relevant cases include in 2001, a female high school basketball player was suspended from the team after circulating a letter calling for removal of the team's coach. She could gain reinstatement by publicly apologizing to the coach and team. The uh, high school student sued, uh, arguing that the condition that she had to publicly apologize violated her First Amendment rights. The court ruled in favor of the school because the letter showed insubordination and disrespect, and schools have an interest in maintaining an atmosphere free of disruption and an atmosphere of sportsmanship. In 2006, a group of basketball players, uh, in this case boys basketball players, felt that their coach was verbally abusive and intimidating and signed a petition calling for his resignation and refused to board the bus for a game. The students were suspended and from basketball and they sued. The court ruled that the suspension was not warranted on the basis of the petition alone because it was the type of speech protected by Tinker. Refusal to board the bus, however, disrupted the school environment and the court ruled that the students could be suspended for that. In addition to regulating speech pursuant to the substantial disruption standard and vulgar, lewd, obscene, or plainly offensive speech, a public school may regulate student-athletes' speech if it's insubordinate or unsportsmanlike. And public schools have greater latitude when regulating student-athletes' speech than the speech of general students. So all of that said, think back to April Gell. <clears throat> so remember that the WIAA is a state actor. Hilbert School District would be or is a state actor. And so they would be infringing upon her First Amendment rights by saying that she can't, by suspending her for what she said on Twitter. But courts have typically ruled that the school district or the WIAA, even though they're state actors, have the ability to regulate that type of insubordinate or unsportsmanlike speech. In that case, it'd be more accurately described as insubordinate. Uh, and so I think if she had filed a suit over that case, I think she would have lost based on that precedent. So I don't think her suit would have been successful. All right. So from the First Amendment on to the 14th, and you can see the wording of the 14th Amendment there, and the stuff that's really relevant is in bold. So the full thing, full 14th Amendment says, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and the state wherein they reside. So again, this amendment was passed after the Civil War, so this is uh, what made um, the freed slaves, made them citizens, made them uh, part of the United States. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. And here's where the really important part for sports starts. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So there's a couple important parts there. The first is due process. So um, where this one comes up is if a student gets suspended, gets their scholarship taken away, um, or gets their sport taken away from them by through a suspension, what the student's going to have to prove is that they have a life, liberty, or property interest that was taken away essentially arbitrarily, that it was just taken away from them without any sort of process followed. So that's the due process clause and where we might see it. And then the last one there is equal protection. So that means that you are being treated differently on the basis of some sort of a characteristic, whether that is race, religion, gender, or the fact that you belong to, um, that you're a student athlete, the fact that you belong to that particular group. So the Equal Protection Clause has typically been used to impose a general restraint on government inequality based on classifications. It keeps the government from discriminating against um, certain categories, so against a particular race, against a particular gender, uh, religion, etc. 
So the classifications that get the most uh, scrutiny, the most restraint, are those based on immutable characteristics. So immutable characteristics are things that you can't change. So that includes things like your race, ethnicity, your sex, things that you're born with. Those are your immutable characteristics. So if the government is discriminating against you on the basis of those immutable characteristics, then whatever government regulation has been passed that discriminates must uh, undergo what's referred to as strict scrutiny. And so scrutiny is a way that the court analyzes whether or not state action should be allowed or rejected. And so strict scrutiny is that whatever the rule is must be necessary and compelling. So what those two things mean, if something is uh, necessary, then that's something that the government must do. Uh, sorry, I flipped them. <laughs> um, a compelling government interest is some, something that the government must do, and then necessary is that there's no other way to achieve that goal. So if we were going to uh, eliminate, if we were going to, let's say, you know, obviously there was segregation um, and discrimination based on race. So if a school district had a, a rule that only allowed white players to try out for a team. Um, if that was a public school and the excluded players filed suit, the court would examine it under strict, strict scrutiny. Uh, and so essentially the rule, in that case segregation, would be something that the government had to do and that there was no other way to achieve that goal. And so clearly in the case of segregation, that's not something that the government has to do. Um, and nor is it the only way to do whatever it is that the government was trying to accomplish with that. So um, strict scrutiny, again, we see come up when the government discriminates based on race or ethnicity. Um, the other place, so, so strict scrutiny also comes up if the government is depriving you of a fundamental right. So if you file a case for government violating your right to freedom of speech or right to freedom of religion, um, the level of scrutiny is going to be necessary and compelling. So this is going to come up in a later chapter when we talk about trademark law. Um, and so essentially, the to give you a preview of what happens, um, the government, the, the original law says that you can't trademark anything that is uh, racist, effectively. There's different wording than that, but effectively it's that you can't trademark something that is racist. And so the question is, is that a violation of people's freedom of speech? And so the government then would have to be doing that that rule that you can't trademark something that's racist that would have to be a compelling government interest uh, and so effectively the government wasn't able to show a compelling interest there uh, nor that that such a restriction was the only way to do that so again we typically see strict strict scrutiny come up at least in the case of um, equal protection as it relates to race if we're thinking about things like gender there we go then the court uses a different standard of review. And so that's intermediate scrutiny, which is that whatever that rule says is substantially related to an important government interest. So again, we see this come up with gender. So if um, women are barred from playing sports on the basis of their gender, so this will come up uh, when we get to the gender chapter, we'll talk about um, women and particularly girls being excluded from sports like Little League Baseball. And so the important government interest that, that Little League argues is that their interest is safety. So, so safety isn't something, uh, ensuring the safety of the citizens isn't something that the government has to do, but it's something that the government should do. And so that rule of not allowing girls to play with boys is substantially related. Those two are, um, are almost inextricably linked that that rule is substantially related to achieving that interest of safety for those girls so ultimately as you would imagine those arguments don't hold up and we'll talk about why that is in a future chapter uh, in the in the gender chapter but you can see the the wording is a little bit different so um, a compelling government interest again is something that the gov a government must do as opposed to an important government interest is something that it should do and so one of the key cases related to this comes from 1978, and it's actually a case against the New York Yankees. And so what ended up happening there was in the late 1970s, the New York Yankees had a policy that they excluded female sports reporters from the locker room in Yankee Stadium. And so Yankee Stadium, the older Yankee Stadium, 
was owned by the government. And so effectively then it was the government that was discriminating because the government had a policy not allowing women into the locker room to do interviews. So the female reporter, her name was Melissa Lutke. Uh, she worked for Sports Illustrated. And so she and her attorneys argued that the policy um, was discriminatory. And so that underwent intermediate scrutiny in the courts. Uh, the Yankees and the city of New York argued that the policy was substantially related to uh, the important goals of protecting the privacy of players who are undressed, protecting the image of baseball as a family sport, and preserving traditional, traditional notions of decency and propriety. And in their ruling, the court recognized that interviews immediately after the game would offer an important advantage to reporters who had access. So in that case, by that government rule being in place, the male reporters had an advantage over the female reporters. Uh, further, the court pointed out that players could undress behind a curtain or swinging door, and that towels were available to maintain privacy before or after showering, and thus banning female reporters was not substantially related to an important government interest. So while all of those interests of um, maintaining baseball's image as a family sport, notions of decency, privacy, etc., while those all may be valid government interests or important government interests, there were less discriminatory means of achieving them, and so the court found that rule to uh, be a violation of that reporter's 14th Amendment rights to equal protection. Basically, the government was discriminating against her because she was a woman, and then that obviously had an effect on her career in that case. So this case, actually, that the Ludke case is kind of interesting uh, in that the court found the Yankees were a state actor because the city of New York had invested significant public funds to enhance the drawing power of the Yankees by modernizing and improving the stadium. But four years later, the court held that government funding alone was not sufficient for state action. So based on a 1982 ruling, even though um, the majority of funding for some NFL stadiums and baseball and basketball comes from public funds, based on that 82 ruling, um, that funding alone is not sufficient to mean that the uh, club is a state actor. And then the lowest level of scrutiny there is rational basis. So whatever the rule is, simply has to be rationally related to a legitimate government interest. So a legitimate government interest isn't necessarily something that the government should do, it's something that the government can do. And then rationally related is basically a way of achieving it. So if we go through these, strict scrutiny then, something that the government has to do, that's compelling, and it's necessary and that's the only way the government can do it, as opposed to an important government interest is something that it should do, and this is substantially related, a, a way to think about it is effectively that's the best way to do it. So this is the best way of achieving something that the government should do. And then lastly, a rational basis review is that this is um, logically related, if you will, to something that the government can do. So um, this is actually gonna come up with cases related to things like uh, student athletes, because the rights in question, if, if the government is singling you out in that case on your basis as, on the basis of the fact that you're a student athlete, well, you don't have to belong to that group. You've chosen to be affiliated with that group. It's not like race, it's not like gender or ethnicity. It's not something that's an immutable characteristic. So things that are not related to immutable characteristics, so groups that you've chosen to affiliate yourself with, if the government singles you out for special rules by your affiliation with those groups that you've chosen to belong to, then the rule is typically, or the level of review is typically rational basis. So where this kind of stuff comes up, so this stuff obviously crosses over quite a bit with some of what we talked about with uh, employment law last week. So there's two types of discrimination that can lead to an equal protection clause challenge. And so those two types are listed for you there. There's de jure discrimination and de facto discrimination. So de jure discrimination is discrimination by law. So the intent there is to discriminate. So anytime a law or policy has a discriminatory purpose. So segregation laws, Jim Crow laws, were de jure, were by law discrimination. That was discriminating was the intent of the law. The second one there is de facto, which is in practice. So in de facto discrimination, a law or policy lacks a discriminating or discriminatory purpose, but has a discriminatory effect. So for example, um, when schools divide up uh, district lines to, to determine who goes to which school, the way those lines are drawn up 
um, may have the effect of discriminating against one race or another, um, segregating people based on uh, income status, those kinds of things. So we talked about affirmative action programs uh, last week. So remember that affirmative action programs are those that are designed to reverse the effects of past and current discrimination. So typically it involves hiring or admittance policies, so admitting into college, for example, um, that assist people who are members of a group or classification of people who have been discriminated against mostly in the past, um, but not, not always. Uh, and so those who have been discriminated in the past include minorities and women. So affirmative action um, laws or affirmative action policies can be controversial because discrimination can't be reversed without treating people differently based on the same criteria on which past discrimination was based. And so this has been referred to as reverse discrimination. Courts have generally upheld these rules, um, that these rules result in a benign type of discrimination. So one of the more prominent cases that has come up recently was related to admission policies. Um, so this particular one happened to be at the University of Texas. So this case was decided by the Supreme Court in 2016. So Supreme Court of the US, not the Supreme Court of Texas. Um, and so in that case, the Supreme Court held that UT could consider race as one factor among many to help ensure a diverse student body. Because the way that admission at UT and actually all state universities in Texas works is that, well, particularly at UT, uh, approximately half, or sorry, approximately 70% of the freshman class is admitted under something called the top 10% rule, which is that if you're in the top 10% of your graduating class at your school, you get automatic admission to any public university in the state. So that includes UT, but also Texas Tech, uh, Texas State, if you want to go there. So if you're in the top 10% of your graduating class at your high school, you get into any public school in the state. But Texas and Texas A&M, the two big state schools, don't have room for all of those students, so they, they end up capping the number of top 10% admissions that they allow. So beyond that cap, UT reserves a number of seats for applicants based on other qualifications. So for example, spots for athletes, spots for out-of-state or international students, and spots that take into account other qualifications beyond high school rank. So included in those other things are um, aspects or components like extracurricular activities, SAT or ACT scores, volunteering, family background, race, or ethnicity. So the case was brought by a, a young lady who's pictured there named Abigail Fisher, who is denied admission to UT. In the fall of 2015, only 39% of applicants were accepted, so UT's admissions are, are pretty competitive, as are Madison's, of course. So when Fisher applied in 2008, 92% of the spots in that class went to people in the top 10%. She wasn't in the top 10% of her, of her graduating class. She went to a, a school in the Houston suburbs. So for the remaining 841 spots in UT's class, the denial rate was higher than Harvard. Admissions officers for those spots took into account what they referred to or what was dubbed the Personal Achievement Index, which included essays and activities other, uh, and then another category that considered socioeconomic status, household, like the number of people in your household, native language, and race. So Fisher had a 3.5 GPA and an 1180 SAT, both of those well below average for the UT freshman class. And so Texas officials said that even if she'd been given all the points for her race, as well as maxed out points in the other categories, it wouldn't have been enough to offset her grades and SAT score. So these policies, affirmative action policies, are subject to to strict scrutiny, and the Supreme Court has repeatedly held that reversing past discrimination is a compelling government interest, so it's something that the government has to do. Affirmative action plans must be narrowly tailored, and that's really important, to do only what is necessary, and if less discriminatory means are available, then those should be used first. You should not use quotas, and employers shouldn't enter with the goal of hiring someone based on their based on their status in a suspect or semi-suspect class. So you shouldn't go into a job search with the intent of hiring a minority or necessarily with the intent of hiring a woman. Um, from a sports standpoint, these have been used to promote diversity in co coaching hires, so as we talked about um, with the NFL's Rooney Rule. There we go. And now we're on to the last one, so the Fifth Amendment. So the Fifth Amendment, there's a lot of crossover between the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendment um, because both of them have due process clauses. So either or both are sometimes invoked um, if, some, if someone is deprived of something. Uh, they may sue citing both of those amendments. 
So due process exists to protect people from arbitrary, capricious, or unreasonable government restriction. So government just, just taking something from you with no valid reason. So to trigger this clause, the government must attempt to deprive someone of life, liberty, or property interest. A liberty interest is pretty general, and it includes all the privileges recognized as essential to the orderly pursuit of happiness. So things that you need in order to, to be happy. So that includes, obviously, your physical freedom. Um, in sport, liberty interest generally refers to damage to a person's reputation when fired from a job. So an employer uh, must make statements that, uh, so if, if that happens, if you're going to sue under this, uh, the employer must make statements that would seriously damage standing of an individual within their profession and stigmatize them publicly. The employee must claim that the charges are false. So for example, in Ludwig versus the Board of Trustees of Ferris State University, a press release issued by the university alleged that a basketball coach, whom they were firing, had used racial slurs. The coach then filed a lawsuit alleging that he had been deprived of a property interest, his job, without due process of law. Among the complaints was a liberty interest in the form of damage to his reputation. The coach lost the suit on the basis that he did not request a name-clearing hearing first, so he didn't effectively go through all the channels before taking the school to court, and thus did not act... Um, exercise all avenues of due process available to him. So effectively, he's, he's saying that the school took his job without following the proper channels, but then he didn't pursue the proper channels himself in order to rebut that job loss. So another aspect here is that, um, so a life, life interest is obviously your life, so if, if the government kills you, um, then your next of kin uh, might bring a case related to the loss of life on the part of a government on the part of the government or a governmental entity um, if the government's going to deprive you of a property interest so where that comes in is um, as it relates to scholarships or opportunities to participate at the collegiate level that's where we tend to see those things so as it pertains to due process there's two types of due process that you can see there substantive due process and procedural due process so for substantive due process, um, that concerns the actual rule or regulation in question. Whatever it is, is unfair or arbitrary, so um, just kind of random, if you will, in content. Um, or, nah, we'll stick with that. So it's, it's unfair uh, or arbitrary in content. So as an example, if an athletic department has a rule that athletes accused of using or possessing drugs will lose their scholarship. We'll pretend that a volleyball player is accused of drug possession after police find drugs in a car in which she's a passenger. The athletic department is notified and cancels the volleyball player's scholarship because, again, their policy is that an athlete is uh, accused of using or possess possessing drugs, then they lose their scholarship. But this young woman, in, in our scenario here, was just riding in the car with someone else who happened to be in the possession of drugs. And so she then loses her scholarship, um, she would have to prove deprivation of a life, liberty, or property interest by a state actor. If it's a state school, obviously that's pretty easy to prove, and she has a property interest in her scholarship that has real value. Now, an important thing here is that if you don't yet have the scholarship, so if it's a, I am a highly touted recruit and a bunch of schools are offering me scholarships but I haven't actually signed, then that is probably not going to be considered a property interest. So... One of the things that our volleyball player in our scenario here, which I stole from the textbook, um, but one of the things that she could do is to challenge the rule on the basis of being arbitrary, that she was merely in the car in which the drugs were found. The government would probably survive uh, a substantive due process challenge if it can show a rational basis for the rule being challenged here. So remember, rational basis, um, so we're talking about this is something that the government can do, and it's a way that the government can do it. So in that lowest level of scrutiny, the courts tend to side with the government to avoid interfering with the rulemaking of government without good cause. The player seems to have a good case for a violation of the due process clause, but the school may argue that it is a strong drug culture and that student athletes are heavily involved, and so a strict rule against drug use um, is necessary. The second one on there is procedural due process. So it's not a challenge of the rule per se, only the way that the rule was applied. So... Um, Effectively, you're, you're alleging that the rule itself is arbitrary or unfair. So 
depending upon what is being taken away, that's going to determine how much due process needs to be given. So for something like a parking ticket, if there's a $25 fine, there's not a lot of due process involved there. So if it's something like that, that's minimum due process, that only involves a statement of the violation, which is you parked in the wrong space, notice of the sanctions, which in that case would be $25 fine, and an opportunity for the accused to comment. There doesn't even need to be an opportunity to appeal in that case. Maximum due process, so in that case, think about if you got kicked out of school. So um, if, for example, a coach is accused of improper conduct and likely to be fired, something like maximum due process would probably be required. So maximum due process includes things uh, like written notice of a hearing, written, written statement of the charges, providing a hearing or trial where both sides can present arguments and can be heard by neutral decision makers, a recording of the proceedings, and then a right to appeal the decision of those proceedings. So maximum due process then is going to involve several more layers. So the more substantial the fine, the more the larger the thing being taken away. Um, you know, if it's a, a lifetime ban from sport as opposed to a one game ban, there's a pretty significant difference between those two. And so a lifetime ban would require much more in terms of due process, the hearing, the witnesses, all of those kinds of things. So courts have consistently held the students have a property right to education. Suspension of 10 days or less require entitlement to oral or written notice of charges and the opportunity to deny those charges. Now, that's not sport. That's just if they're expelled or kicked out of school for uh, 10 days or less. On the other hand, courts have typically held that there is not a, pr a protected property interest in participating in a single year of interscholastic competition. So that's not 100% consistent. A Florida court held that a student athlete had a property interest in sport participation as part of his rehabilitation from prior problems as a juvenile delinquent. Um, and then total exclusion for lengthy periods of time, so again, a lifetime ban, those might also invoke due process claims. But in general, um, if a student gets suspended for the year for some sort of a violation, then that is something that uh, courts have typically held is not necessarily a property interest and so something the school might be allowed to do. All right, so that's it for constitutional law. So make sure that you answer the questions on the discussion board. And again, as it pertains to freedom of religion, make sure that you address those specific tests. So things like the lemon test, endorsement, uh, and coercion. So we'll see you next week.